Yo, what's up? We're back for another week of predictions, and this week it's UFC on Fox 29. Um, and first off, I want to go over the uh, results of last week. It wasn't really the same card that we um, uh, covered, you know, with all the changes. I mean, that was probably one of the craziest weeks in uh, MMA history, to be honest with you. But, you know, we ended up going 7-2 uh, and two overall either way, which uh, is pretty good. You know, we hit um, on Chris Grutzmacher, who is an underdog. Um, thought there was a lot of great fights, you know, Rose vs. Joanna was a very great fight, thought we, um, you know, were able to see some things as well in, uh, Khabib's game that maybe other people can exploit, so overall it was a good night of fights, and, um, thought a lot of people did well, you know, that, um, Zabit fight versus Kyle Bokniak was an incredible fight, and, um, overall, you know, I thought that, uh, a lot of people performed well in that card, you know, everything, um, to say, I thought the Felice fight against Carolina was a very good fight as well. I thought both girls showed themselves well. I kind of, uh, you know, I'm a fan of Felice, so I, I was a little bit sad that she lost there, but it was a deserved loss, even though she seemed like she's uh, really turned the corner. She's starting to fight well. She wasn't backing down in that fight, but we're going to get right into uh, UFC on Fox 29, and uh, the first fight of the night's a pretty interesting one with uh, the return of Muslim Salikov again. You know, he came into the UFC with a lot of hype because of his uh, background in, uh, you know, striking. I think he was like a 185-13 and 13 record as a uh, professional kickboxer. And, uh, you know, he's only been KO'd one time in that in 198 fights. So you just see how good he is with the striking. Only be KO'd one time 198 kickboxing fights. And he's fighting against uh, Ricky Rainey, um, UFC guy, or <laughs> Bellator guy, who, um, coming over, he's kind of long striker as well. But recently, I've seen him, he's been uh, deciding to grapple a bit more. So this is going to be a pretty interesting fight. You know, uh, they call Salik off the King Kung Fu because he uh, has a lot of spinning kicks, does a lot of, um, you know, spinning back kicks to the body. He... Uh, KO'd uh, Ivan George with a really bad one, just completely froze him up. He has a really nice uppercut, nice spinning back fist. Throws big power, good timing on his punches. He's one of the best strikers at, at 170, obviously. But he just, um, you have to wonder about his takedown defense and everything like that. Because against Alex Garcia, he did show some decent takedown defense. He was able to sidestep a few takedowns. He was able to get up a couple times. But eventually he was submitted. And you've seen him get submitted before as well against Chris Holcomb, who, um, you know, is not a very high-level fighter. He's fought a lot of times in Japan. I think this might be um, his first fight in the U.S. in a long time for um, MMA because the fight against, uh, or not in Japan, excuse me, in China. And the fight against um, Alex Garcia was in China as well. And um, I think that he's fought... Uh, almost exclusively in China's entire career. I'm not sure if he's um, ever came over and fought in the United States before for uh, MMA. So that's also another thing that you're going to have to look into for this fight. And um, he seemed like he was getting a bit tired in that fight as well against um, Alex Garcia. So there's a lot of question marks with Muslim Salikov. But one thing you can't question is his... Uh, you know, his striking, but Ricky Rainey, you know, he's a, he's a good striker as well, he's long, he's someone that I did see get very much dominated by another very high level striker, Michael Page, it was almost an embarrassing performance, but that was a while ago, and recently I've seen him like to get in the clinch, he likes to try to grind, try to take people down, doing it against Chidi and Jikawani. he was able to, uh, you know, use a lot of control in that fight, and um, I don't know, I just feel like I'm uh, we know more about Ricky Rainey than we do about Muslim Salikov. Maybe Muslim Salikov would knock him out. But I'm going to have to go with the safe pick here. I'm going to go with Ricky Rainey. I'm going to say that he's able to, uh, you know, close that distance. He's able to get inside. He's able to get the clinch. He's able to, you know, be formidable enough on the outside that he doesn't get knocked out, doesn't get stopped, doesn't get rocked. And I think he's going to be able to win a unanimous decision there. One of my least confident picks in that one. Both those guys are kind of question marks. But, um, you know, I'm going to say Ricky Rainey gets it done in his UFC debut. And moving on to a couple more guys that are a little bit more established, a little bit more that we can delve into. And that's uh, Matthew Lopez against Alejandro Perez. And um, 
Alejandro Perez is surprisingly, you know, strung a lot of wins together in the UFC. I think he's won two in a row, but he's 5-1-1 one, one in the UFC, so really good for his first start. And then Matthew Lopez, someone that I've actually enjoyed watching. I think that he's pretty good. He's 2-2, two and two, but he's definitely faced the much better competition. You know, he recently lost to uh, Rafael Asuncao, and that might have been a, a life-changing knockout. It was a very bad knockout, um, you know, so I... We're going to see how he bounces back here from that knockout. And it hasn't been entirely that long. It's only been five months since that happened. So really going to have to see how Matthew Lopez's chin holds up. But overall, he's a great wrestler. He's actually the uh, wrestling coach at Grudge Training Center. And um, good double leg, great body lock as well. Great timing on the body lock. He was able to uh, get a body lock against a Sun Sal in round one. And uh, everyone knows how hard a Sun Sal is to take down. So that's... Pretty good accomplishment there. He drives through on his shots. Uh, very big power and explosion. And uh, when he gets a hold of you, he has very good chain wrestling, chain together attempts, switch angles, uh, try to land big slam takedowns. On the feet, he still has uh, quite a bit to learn. He's a bit slow in space. He can walk into range with his hands low. Uh, he doesn't really throw many shots. And he can get clipped with big hooks, big hooks coming inside at times. Solid kicks, uh, land a leg kick, body kick, but he doesn't throw a ton of kicks. He has decent speed, pretty loose with his hands. You know, you could throw some snappy punches, decent combinations, solid right hook. If you get in the pocket with him, he will throw heat. He'll try to knock you out, kind of wild. Uh, he throws the jab out there, very susceptible to leg kicks. He got his leg battered in his last fight against the Sun Sal, but the Sun Sal is one of the best leg kickers in the division, so... I don't know if Alejandro Perez will have quite as much success, but definitely something to look into. He has good pressure, and when he takes you down, uh, he goes for a lot of submissions. Good ground and pound. He really hammered Johnny and Warder off for a first-round TKO. Against Ronnie Yaya, he actually showed some impressive grappling as well, especially in round one. He's able to catch Yaya in an arm bar, an inverted triangle, scrambling very well, holding top position, and everyone knows how good Hani Yaya is as a grappler one of the best in uh, MMA history and uh, he grinded out Mitch Gagnon as well and he survived uh, being rocked dropped hard had to come back to win he does seem to slow down a bit in round three he was submitted by Ronnie Yaya in round three and uh, absolutely flatlined by Sun Sal in round three and he's training with Trevor Whitman Justin Gaethje and those guys for this fight Gaethje's going to be the main event so he'll definitely be in shape I bet He's tough, he'll grind on you, and if you can't stop it, um, you know he's going to do it all night, or he's going to take you out on the ground, but Alejandro Perez is a counter-striker with some wrestling as well, um, light on his feet, uses some movement, and uh, solid footwork, he tries to stay in range and counter, but has solid defense, likes to slip and rip in the pocket with his right hand, throw hard inside low kicks, and uh, really beats up the front leg, he can get his leg kicked a lot as well though. He is a counter-striker. He waits for you to uh, move in, try to draw you out, and uh, really likes to fight at a slow pace, low guys, into, low guys to sleep, and kind of try to win these close decisions. He can be very inactive, doesn't really ever take a big risk to, to finish the fight or change the tide, but he does catch kicks, comes back with the right hand very well. Doesn't seem like he has big power, and he doesn't seem to hurt his opponents. But he does have a good chin, and he can uh, come back from being dropped. Great cardio. Dropped three times against Andre Sukumtath. Came back to win that fight somehow. He will get go for double leg takedowns. And uh, he had a very boring fight versus uh, Yuri Alcantara. Nothing really happened. But he was able to get the win. You know, he was able to really start putting it on Alcantara as Alcantara faded uh, going into the later rounds. And he's training at AKA. He's had Khabib in his corner, so I'm sure he's trying to improve his grappling. And he has. He has improved his grappling. He's gotten much better his takedowns. And I just, but I just don't see Lopez being the type of guy that'll let Perez weasel out a decision. I think that he's someone that's going to bring the action, bring the pressure. And he just needs to worry about not getting hit clean coming in. But I don't see Perez being able to take a decision here. I just don't think that his style is going to be able to work out against a guy that's going to be grinding and pressuring so much like Lopez. And Lopez should be able to dominate the grappling, control the pace. But we do need to see how he returns from that KO against the Sun Sal. And, um, you know, other than that, I am confident that he would win. If he didn't have that knockout, I'm saying I think that he would be one of my more confident picks of the night. But um, 
I don't think Perez has enough power to do what Asuncao did. So I'm going to say that Matthew Lopez wins uh, via unanimous decision, 30-27, uh, you know, using a lot of wrestling, a lot of uh, ticked out attempts, chaining them together, and uh, just gets the win there. And then up next, we have Luke Sanders against Patrick Williams. And uh, Patrick Williams is uh, pretty athletic, you know, former Arizona State wrestler. Uh, you know, he's aggressive, very dangerous early. Uh, choked out Alejandro Perez uh, in 23 seconds, so, you know, shows how dangerous he is there. Landed a long right hand and then just choked him out. It was a really tight ch- uh, tight uh, choke. Um, he's very amateurous with his striking, though. He stays super far on the outside, well out of range. And then just tries to lunge in with crazy blitzes and uh, puts everything into all his shots and really goes for it early to try to get that early stoppage. Uses a lot of lateral movement. He has an okay double leg, a solid trip takedown, decent ground and pound, but he doesn't have the best top control. Really likes to attack with lunging uppercuts that are almost like shovel hooks. And if he lands, he definitely has power, but uh, almost all his offense is from his right hand and his right leg. Barely ever using his left side unless it's kind of like a wild combination. He can't get caught moving in. And the way he exits the pocket is horrible. You know, he just almost runs away after he strikes. And when he comes in with his hands down and his chin is straight up in the air, he's just um, thinking about one thing that he's going to KO you, but just forgets about his defense. He's been brutally finished two times in the UFC. You know, flatlined by Chris Beal with a beautiful flying knee. And then uh, finished most recently by Tom Dukenwall. And he's been very inactive. Had a ton of injuries. Only fought three times in four years. He's 36 years old. And uh, says that injuries really affected his last camp. So who knows. And uh, since he puts everything in his to his tax early. He lasts about three minutes. But he is dangerous, long, athletic, powerful. You have to respect him. But anyone that can avoid that will beat him easily. And uh, most likely finish him, you know. And... Saunders fought a similar style and uh, what I think is actually a better fighter in Maximo Blanco. And he dropped him with a huge left hand then finished him with a rear naked choke. And uh, Sanders has good movement. He does a good job of controlling distance. Slowly pushing you back and he slides out of the way of your shots. Comes back with his own. He likes to throw the left hook. Close the distance with the left and right hooks. He doesn't seem to uh, throw very many kicks. And he seems a bit slow with his punches and entries. In the clinch, he's uh, pretty strong, though. Good knees and elbows. Big power. He's a good wrestler himself. Good body lock. Great scrambles. Really good at keeping the top position. And uh, he'll attack with big, heavy ground and pound. And uh, he pounded out Al Qatar. Landed a large amount of ground and pound. Uh, really good at controlling with that wrestling ride kind of thing where he's on your back. Inside control, landing big punches. But he seems to have questionable fight IQ, man. He was dominating Al Qatar. Put the, his leg in the wrong position. Uh, landed an illegal knee for no reason as well in that fight. Lost a point. But, uh, you know, fell asleep, panicked, and tapped out to a leg lock. But um, he was throwing a sod right hand, using a lot of fakes and feints, hide his entries. Came in with the big left and right straight hooks. Lands a solid body kick. Um, you know, he threw a bit more variety in his previous fights, though. And uh, he was finished pretty bad um, by KO as well in his fight against um, Andre Sukumtath. But I just think that he should be able to win this fight here. I think that um, Williams and Saunders are both pretty big bantamweights. And that's a big advantage for Williams usually. And Saunders definitely needs to be careful in those first two minutes. But after that, like I said, Williams really seems to run out of gas and... um, just terrible defense, and I think that he's going to get met with a brutal left hook. Sanders shows that he has big power in that left hook, and um, I think that he's going to knock out Patrick Williams late in round one, but a lot of these guys are coming back quick from KO, TKOs on this card, man, like Luke Saunders coming back four months later after getting knocked out, so definitely have to look and see how he looks, but um, up next to the return of Arjun Buller, who's... Um, you know, a pretty big deal over in uh, Canada and India as well. It's kind of another progression fight for him to, uh, you know, build his name. And he kind of, the UFC wants to break into that Indian market. And Bular gives him a great chance to do it. He's a great talker. And he understands that um, 
doing that will earn him a lot more fans and notoriety, you know, so he's really been pushing it as well. I think that he got the approval to wear a hijab to the cage in this fight, so that'll be interesting. And, um, you know, he has a great wrestling background, former uh, Commonwealth Games gold medalist, uh, multiple-time NAIA champion. He's still relatively young in his MMA career, though, at 7-0. and But he's transitioned fairly well. Um, doesn't throw a lot of volume or variety on the feet yet, but solid footwork, good movement for a heavyweight, good job of cutting off the cage, making it small, pressuring, landing the jab to keep range. And for being so young in his career, he's shown great calmness, ability to relax, do his thing. And I think the years of wrestling have allowed him to just worry about competition, you know. And he slowly plots forward, looks for big hooks. He dropped uh, Luis Enrique with a big right and had a massive double leg uh, takedown as well in that fight, showing big power. Seems to love half guard and um, could control there, throw hard elbows. Good control on top, stays tight. And if he gets on top, you're not going to get up, really, unless the ref is going to stand you up. First position over huge ground and pound or submission really just tries to keep you down. He can get caught walking in sometimes, but he seems to take the shots well. He has a good chin. You know, obviously, he hasn't taken that much damage yet. He has good cardio as well for heavyweight. Seems to be able to push the whole fight. You know, stay at, you know, a deliberate pace, but not, you know, crazy pace. You know, his last fight, Luis Henrique is a decent wrestler, solid fighter. And I actually believe this is kind of a step down for Arjun Bular. Um, Bular did seem to be a bit tired in round three. Um, but he did show he still doesn't, uh, and he showed he still doesn't know how to strike backwards very well. And uh, Adam Weisrich's a long heavyweight, tries to use movement, stay long, throw those front kicks to the body, leg kicks. He can get stuck against the cage though, and he was taken down easily by Anthony Hamilton multiple times. Seems to have decent ground uh, guard recovery, stays busy, you know, does a good job of uh, using his long limbs, just making himself annoying on the ground. Doesn't have a great get-up game, though. He can be controlled on his back, even if you're not getting off a ton of damage. But he does have five submissions, so he is a bit dangerous. But his submissions are mostly from top position. On the feet, he has decent speed and kicks. He'll attack with head kicks, strong hooks. Keeps his left hand very low. He will not fake or faint either. And um, waits a lot for you to start the engagement, just pawing his jab out. His hands don't seem very good either, and he uses them more as range finders for his kicks. In the clinch, he has some okay knees, but he can be bullied, taken down. He does have a decent, uh, do a decent job of standing up against the cage, but he also gets tired as well. You know, in round three, him and Anthony Hamilton were both pretty exhausted. And like I said, his takedown defense is very questionable. Unless Bullard gets flash KO'd or submitted here, which I just don't think is very likely, I think that he's going to win a very easy decision, 30-27, or even finish uh, with ground and pound in this fight. I just think that his wrestling is just on a different level than Adam Weizerich. And then up next, you have a really, you know, kind of weird fight. Yushin Okami against Diego Lima. You know, battle two fighters kind of going nowhere fast, in my opinion, in the UFC. Okami, you know, a former title challenger. Found his way back into the UFC, uh, except in a short notice fight at 205 pounds against OSP. And uh, lost that very quickly, but now he's coming back at 170, 35 pounds lighter. So it was definitely a bit crazy, you know, for um, Okami to take that fight at 205. He has been fighting at 170 as well. I think that his last four fights besides the OSP fight were all at 170. So, um, you know, you got to appreciate his heart and his tenacity for taking that fight at 205, but definitely wasn't a good idea. But it is pretty crazy to see Okami at 170, you know, if you're an old school fan. He used to be pretty massive at 185 back in the day. But um, Diego Lima is another guy who's in his second UFC stint. Kind of came up short on um, tough the first time. And then, uh, you know, went in the UFC, fought a few times. Got cut and came back on that tough redemption show against Jesse Taylor. He fought in the finale. Lost in the finale. Got dominated pretty much. He was able to land one strike, drop Taylor. But uh, Lima's not nearly been as successful as Okami in the UFC. He's 1-4 and four and uh, being stopped multiple times in the UFC. And he's taken a lot of damage. Uh, he is the younger, younger fighter, but I'd say he definitely is less durable with the worst chin. And uh, he's been TKO'd. Uh, you know, 
four times, three of them being in the UFC, and all four of his UFC losses are by stoppage. So seems like he's not on this level, but they're giving him another chance here. And this is most likely a loser leaves town match, you know, with the winner getting one more shot, I guess. But Lima had a decent show in making it to the finals at Tough 25, but largely still has the same holes he had in his game years ago. You know, he likes to use a lot of ladder movement, try to stay long, throwing body kicks, counter right straights. But he's still stiff on the feet, especially with his punching. He can look like he's in quicksand a bit, just a little bit slow. Does have solid kicks uh, to the body and the head, but he isn't super active on the feet. And he seems like he likes to take you down now more than anything. You know, he tries uh, to take you down whenever he can, uh, and he tries to get your back against the cage. Really likes to try to get the back. He'll attack with a double leg. On top, he isn't super active. Uh, just really, like I said, just searching for the back, trying to get the rear naked choke. But he showed that he can get bullied in grappling situations in his last fight. Gets Jesse Taylor, absolutely dominated, taken down in round one, gave up his back, was controlled, ground and pound, big shots, basically controlled the whole round. Round two, he landed a good left hook, dropped Jesse Taylor, uh, tried to jump on his back, get the rear naked, and he was reversed and uh, got his back taken and got choked out, you know, seconds later. Pretty wild exchange there. But um, I just don't think he move, he doesn't move his feet or react uh, quick enough to getting pushed back and uh, when he gets caught against the cage he's extremely vulnerable both to the knockout and that takedown and off his back he goes for triangles but he doesn't have a great get up game he he is tough he'll ask for more in brawls he definitely you know is not someone that's going to back down from a fight but it's kind of to his disadvantage because he doesn't have the best chin and uh, his cardio is also pretty questionable but Okami is coming back after losing, like I said, quick fashion to OSP. And previously to that, he was 4-1 at 170. And, uh, you know, so we're going to see how he keeps doing it. And, uh, you know, he slowed down significantly from his prime, though. But he still has some decent fluid combinations with his hands. Uh, throws a nice straight left hand with pretty big power on it. Nice snappy jab. Uh, good kick to the body. He likes to kind of walk backwards, slowly try to draw you into his power. Uh, this could possibly be a very, very boring and slow fight on the feet. Or I could see Okami just strong arm in the clinch. and uh, Or really just taking him out with one punch. I see Okami the one being more likely to get the finish here. But um, Okami's still very strong in the clinch. She'll attack with good knees to the body. Has a good body lock. Does a great job getting top position, getting dominant position. Tries to go for damage or the submission. Doesn't really try to hold the position that much. He has a questionable chin as well, but I think that, um, but I believe that, you know, Okami is just going to be the bigger, stronger guy in this fight, and, uh, Lima won't have his usual, you know, biggest strength, which is large height and reach advantage. He usually has a big reach advantage over his opponents, and it won't be the same in this fight, and I see Okami being able to either hurt Lima standing or just bully him in the clinch, take him down, and, um, I'm going to go with Okami by decision or TKO finish due to ground and pound. I just think Lima still has too many holes for a crafty vet like Okami. And um, we'll let Okami get a win in his later years in the UFC here. And we'll see if he can maybe string together a couple more. But I just don't see a lot of hope for either guy, even if the uh, whoever the winner is in the UFC going forward. But up next, we have a fight between uh, two pretty interesting prospects at 125. I actually was surprised watching the tape. Uh, Shayna Dobson and Lauren Mueller and um, you know both these girls are very aggressive and very uh, good finishers but Shayna Dobson's coming off a win on the, the tough finale she's still very raw but she's an intriguing prospect doesn't have much wrestling in her ground game at all but what she does have is big power and she walks forward those thudding inside leg kicks she'll go up top to the head with big power good speed she has good chin uh Good physicality in the cage. She really uh, shucks off takedowns pretty easily sometimes. And uh, being willing to take shots in the pocket to close the distance and land her own. She is a bit plodding. She keeps her chin up in the air. But she, uh, her own power in her hands is just much bigger than a lot of these girls' power. Big right hook. And, um, you know, she's very much right hand dominant. Nice uh, right uppercut as well. Um, when she has you hurt, she'll land that. 
overhand right, right uppercut combo. That's she landed to finish Ariel back in their last fight. Um, she does seem to have cardio issues. And this is a fun matchup because Mueller is also a come forward striker. Uh, she's trading at Alliance now, so she has good teammates. But she likes to walk you down, throw heat, nice long punches. Very good uppercut, very nice right hand. She'll throw a head kick. She seems to have big power in her punches. On the Dana White Contender Series, the girl was really fit on the shots she was throwing. Um, she throws wild techniques to close the distance sometimes, like Superman punches. And she really likes to work in the clinch, land hard knees to the body and to the head, and really go for the finish in that clinch. And uh, she has cardio problems as well because she goes full blast in her attacks, throws everything in her shots, gets very tired, takes huge breaths. But she still walk you down and... Uh, but just won't throw as much. You know, she took a whole round off in her Dana White contender. She's fight the second round. But, um, she can struggle to find her range as well. Once she gets tired, has her hands down, just plods forward. And, uh, she seems to have a good chance. She eats shots and reacts well. And, um, apparently that fight in the Dana White contender, she was on one week's notice. So that may be why she was so tired. And, uh, I just think Mueller will win because she has better cage control, clinch knees. And I think she's just the better grappler here. But this is going to be a tight fight. Both girls have finishing power. And they're both, you know, more two of the more interesting prospects at 125. You know, that's a pretty shallow division. So um, both those girls could definitely make an impact rather quickly, in my opinion. But uh, up next, you have Dan Moret against Gilbert Burns. And uh, this is going to be a pretty quick breakdown because I didn't get to see much against uh, much of Dan Moret. Saw a couple fights, very quick finishes. And uh, this is his debut fight. He's MMA lab guy. A good number of MMA lab people are fighting on this card. You know, Dan Moret, John Moraga, Courtney Casey. So they're going to have a crew there fighting in Phoenix. Or in Glendale, excuse me. But, um, you know, Gilbert Burns, this fight was... He was supposed to have a fight a while back against Mercier. And they're rescheduling it after he had a botched weight cut. And um, he's had an extended training camp for this fight. Multiple opponents. You know, he had another opponent, I believe, before Dan Moret as well. So, we're going to have to see how he reacts to that. I don't know if it'll be a positive or a negative. And uh, Gilbert Burns is a jiu-jitsu world champion. Um, a lot of people hesitate to get on top of him. Michelle Prezeris, Jason Saga, or saw black belts. And uh, Dan Moret, from what I've seen, is pretty stiff on the feet. Doesn't seem extremely athletic. And uh, seems like he'll throw leg kicks, throw punches but he really tries to get that clinch tries to jump on your back tries to take you down he seems like a grappler and uh Gilbert Burns is just one of the most elite jiu-jitsu practitioners in MMA so just due to that I'm gonna go with Gilbert Burns but I haven't seen that much of Dan Moret striking that many of his fights so maybe he'll surprise us here but I'm gonna go with Gilbert Burns but I'm gonna say he wins by submission in round number two but if Damaret is a good striker, he could definitely beat Gilbert Burns. Gilbert Burns definitely has big striking efficiencies. But uh, up next, we're moving on to a much better fight. And uh, two guys that are on, you know, not on win streaks, but two guys that are very uh, good prospects in this uh, division, in Brad Tavares and Chris Jocko. Brad Tavares is on a win streak. He's actually won um, three in a row, I believe. And Chris Jocko has actually lost two in a row. But he's a very promising prospect as well. And um, he's trying to bounce back after that TKO loss to uh, Uriah Hall. But um, Jocko's very well-rounded. Good instincts for MMA. Very loose hands. Good hand speed. I think he's deceptively long to his opponents. He hits them when they think they're out of range. And he lands a left and right shovel hooks. Uh, really nice. Good power, especially with his right hand. He could knock you out. He was landing some brutal uppercuts against Uriah Hall. Almost had him out of there, and Uriah Hall had a pretty miraculous comeback in that fight. And uh, Jocko has good kicks as well, very mobile. It keeps you at the end of his range. Uh, you know, he could open up with some wild kicks, like spinning heel kicks, but he has a nice roundhouse to the body. He can go high to the head as well. Good defense, does a good job with distance control. Solid grappler as well, great body lock, good timing on it. On top, he can land heavy ground and pound, has solid transitions to more dominant position. Uh, he sweep Talos late, takes a great black belt. He's able to get top control, you know, land a lot of punches, be dominant from there. He has good takedown defense himself, a uh, good get-up game. He had, showed a very good get-up game against David Branch. Uh, Branch is able to control Jocko against the fence a bit, 
But in space, Jocko is a very dangerous striker. You know, good cardio, young, improving. Should be able to bounce back, regain his footing. But this is a tough matchup as well with Brad Tavares. Tavares is a very skillful, technical striker. Snaps off a great jab, nasty leg kicks. Always fainting and faking, controlling distance, throwing a lot of volume. Uh, he tries to get off first to win the striking battle, just kind of frees you with his feints. Land his jab, land his leg kicks, never let you get in a rhythm. Use a lot of movements to try to gauge the distance. And then eventually pull you into his bigger shots. He has a nice straight right hand, a good left hook. Good at getting off first, controlling the exchanges. Solid flying knee. He's always technical on the feet, he has his high guard. Throws his shots, never really gets emotional, never puts himself in harm's way. Sometimes he gets his hands back a little low on his jab. He can get countered with hooks. Seems to be a bit more stiff. You can force him to throw shots in the pocket. You know, longer combinations. He's more comfortable hitting and moving, staying sharp. He's very good in the clinch as well. Very good at reversing, controlling against the fence. He throws a ton of volume. Throws very hard knees, solid elbows. Great job of getting double underhooks against the cage. Uh, strong, good control. Does a good job of landing left hook off the break as well. He was just grappling. Um, good double legs. Change levels. Uh, grab the legs and then come upstairs with punches. Fights at a good pace. Good volume striking. But he all, always wants to be technical. Doesn't like being in wild exchanges as much. If you put him in that wild exchange and make him brawl, I think that he could uh, get clipped, could get hurt. He has great switch on uh, if you go for him with a takedown attempt. He'll try to reverse get top position. Great takedown defense. Great job of getting back to his feet as well. And also a good job of reversing position, getting on top of himself. Good chin, great cardio. Pretty durable guy. Pushed the whole fight. Both these guys have a ton of success winning decisions. Tavares has won all of his UFC fights, but won by decision. And he's 10-2 and in decisions in his career and in his uh, UFC fights. And Jocko is 5-1 and one in decisions in the UFC and 12-1 and one overall. So both guys are, uh, you know, very good point fighters. And both guys have dominant victories over Talos Latis. I think Jocko's the bit better athlete, and he's more loud and more dangerous. But he puts himself in harm's way as well. So this is a close fight. And I'm going to go with Chris Jocko. I'm going to say win the decision. I think he's going to be able to land maybe the more significant, harder shots. I think that he's the better overall athlete. And uh, I think that he'd be able to take Tavares down at 1.2 with the body lock. And uh, I'm going to go with Chris Jocko by decision here. And up next, you have Wilson Hayes against John Moraga, which is, you know, a pretty interesting fight, you know, with two guys going in different directions. John Moraga looked like his career was almost done. You know, he was talking about retiring. And then all of a sudden, now he's won two in a row against uh, two pretty highly touted guys and find himself in there against Wilson Hayes, who's lost two in a row after um, finding himself with a title shot against Demetrius Johnson. So... We're going to be looking to see if John Moraga can keep that momentum going and Wilson Hayes will fall off the map or if Wilson Hayes will be able to, you know, regain his footing here. But um, Moraga is also training at MMA Lab. And since moving to MMA Lab after his uh, downturn, you know, he's been looking really good. I uh, had a great upset knockout against uh, Magomed Bivolatov. Nasty left hook, man. Really, really, really cranked that. Just knocked him out cold. But he's... Moraga did lose three in a row, but he's really only lost some of the best guys in the division. You could argue top five guys. John Dodson twice. You know, he lost to DJ. Lost to Mateus Nikolai, who's a beast. Joseph Benavidez and Sergio Pettis. All those guys are very, very, very high-level competition. And he has solid victories as well. You know, Magomed Bibulatov, Dustin Ortiz, Justin Scoggins. And his fight with Sergio Pettis was a close fight. So definitely has some, you know, high-level performances. Great check, check left hook, straight one-two down the middle. He throws a snappy jab, big power in his shots, especially with that left hook. Good finisher at 125 pounds. Extremely fast and athletic, very fast hands. He always stays very balanced, good position. Always ready to counter if you overextend. He'll make you pay if you make mistakes 100%. He likes to use solid lateral movement, but keep pressure with fakes and feints. Drawing you out, you know, wanting you to shoot, and then he'll come with his counters. Throw good leg kicks, solid kicks to the body as well. He's a wrestler, and while he doesn't use it a ton in his fights, 
He did put on a wrestling clinic against Ashkan Mokhtarian recently and uh, almost submitted him multiple times. Active with the submission game. He'll attack with arm bars from the mount, rear naked chokes. He's very good at getting the back. Attack with big elbows. Does a great job of floating, staying on top, keeping top position. He has great chokes. He'll dive on guillotines. Great proving necktie setup. Good takedown defense himself and a good get up game. You know, he out wrestled Dustin Ortiz. He was able to get quite a few submission attempts on Dustin Ortiz. He was taken down by Sergio Pettis a couple times. He will search for a counter uppercut. His last against gets Bill Lotoff. He was landing a lot of hard low leg kicks. He was controlling distance well, using good footwork. He landed a massive overhand right, then stunned Bill Lotoff, then that left hook that finished him. He's very good. One of the most dangerous 125ers in the division. Five win or five finishes in the UFC with seven wins. And he's going to be much faster here, the better athlete, smoother on his feet. He has a good chin, good cardio as well. He'd definitely be able to go all three rounds. All these guys at 125 seem to be able to go all three. Wilson Hayes has also struggled with quick, quick strikers. You know, he's lost to Patricio Pitbull twice. Lost to Eduardo Dantes. Lost to Uriel Contra. Demetrius Johnson. Henry Cejudo. Who all mostly use a quick striking game to beat him. He's been TKO KO'd three times now. And uh, all of his UFC wins have been versus people who like to grapple. You know, his last five wins, for instance, against UT Sasaki, Hector Sandoval, Dustin Ortiz, Scott Jorgensen, Joby Sanchez. None of those guys are nearly as dangerous or fluid as Moraga on the feet. Hayes is a big guy for 125, a powerhouse wrestler with elite jiu-jitsu. Extremely strong in the clinch at 125. He'll throw you in really good scrambles and transitions. He'll take the back, get the rear naked choke. He has an excellent squeeze, uh, you know, tapping people out even over the chin. Uh, very heavy with his jiu-jitsu, hard to get submission attempts on your back, off, even like, you know, it stays very tight. Good double leg entries, he'll drive you to the fence, try to finish if you can't finish it in space. He is inefficient in space on the feet though, he has power on his shots, but he doesn't fake or faint. Doesn't have good entries or setups, he gets clipped, kind of plods, slowly walks forward, sits on his punches, wings him. He doesn't have the best footwork and movement. He does have a heavy right hook, and he can hurt people with his right hook. And he tries to use that a lot of head movement to offset the fact that he doesn't feign or fake and uh, come in with hooks, kind of like Mike Tyson. He'll throw body kicks, inside leg kicks, but it's slow for 125. He's just not the fastest guy. And uh, tries to wing his left hook to try to catch you with it. And his whole game is to punch his way into the body lock, get the takedown. He has good takedown defense himself, and DJ's the only guy to ever submit him. He has good cardio. He's a pretty easy guy to game plan for, though, in my opinion. And I just think Moraga will use uh, movement, fakes and feints, land his big hard one-twos, his leg kicks, his jabs. And eventually, I think he's going to land a left hook that's going to knock Wilson Hayes out. And I'm going to say he wins by uh, round two, uh, TKO, KO. I'm going to go with John Moraga now, when to keep the streak going. And I think uh, Chicano is going to be able to get it done in that one. Then up next, we have Antonio Carlos Jr. against Tim Bosch in a very, very interesting fight. You know, Tim Bosch, for uh, being 37 years old, he's still kicking in the UFC. And Antonio Carlos Jr., the UFC is kind of trying to test him here with um fringe top 15 guy to see where, where he's at. And I just don't believe that ACJ is the most amazing athlete, but he is getting better at his striking. But he still needs to do a lot of work. He throws a jab out as a solid right hand, good power. Uh, good hard kicks to the body, but he's a bit slow on the feet, and he just looks vulnerable at times. He'll put his chin up in the air, but he does have a solid uppercut. In his last two fights, um, most of them had no striking or very little striking. He has three submissions in his last four wins. Both of these guys are very big for the weight class, use that to their advantage. Carlos Jr. doesn't have the best takedowns, but he's very strong for the division. He'll get the body lock, drag you down. He's really relentless. Really tries to get those double underhooks, put you against the cage, work from there. He'll throw knees to the body in the clinch. Very good on top. Does a great job staying tight, slowly working his way to a mount or rear naked choke. Does a very good job of uh, getting the back mount, especially for a big guy. Has five rear naked chokes in his career. He is still very young in his career. He's only uh, with 11 fights. You know, he's won four in a row since losing to Dan Kelly in embarrassing fashion. But he seems to not nearly be as good off his back. Uh, Marvin Vittori was able to uh, 
control him, land bombs from half guard. But he does have a good guard, good rubber guard. Uh, he'll attack with elbow sweeps. He has gotten better, but he still seems to have the same issues that he had previously with cardio. And uh, he's been fighting good matchups lately. And guys that just don't have the best jiu-jitsu and aren't the best grapplers. But Tim Bosch is clearly the most dangerous guy he's ever fought, in my opinion. Carlos Jr. can be taken down. Vittori was stuffing a lot of his takedowns, and he was able to take down Carlos Jr. And, uh, you know, the barbarian, uh, Tim Bosch, has been putting it down for years, man. He's just a violent individual. Some of the best comeback knockouts in UFC history. You know, those against Yushin Okami, against Brad Tavares. Both those guys are fighting on this card. That's kind of funny. But, uh... Bosch is a wrestler who likes a bang, huge knockout power. And he's sure he's still adding more tools, you know, with this head kick knockout against Tim Bosch. It wasn't a head kick knockout, but the head kick started the finish. And um, he has a really nice right hand. He can land it from very uh, odd angles, from very short distances, and still have big power with it. A nasty short right hook that killed Brad Tavares. Big right hand that finished Rafael Natal. He uses heavy forward pressure, keeps his hands low, letting you try to hit him so he can come back with his own shots. And his last five wins have all been by KO, TKO. His last nine fights have all been finished inside the distance. So, um, you know, maybe the under, or maybe inside the distance for this fight would be a good um, bet if, you think, if you're thinking about doing that. But he, had got, he has gotten TKO twice, submitted twice. But he's lost a very solid competition in those nine fights. And he's a serious veteran, man. He has 11 more UFC fights than Carlos Jr. has fights, period, with 22. And uh, against Jacare, Tim was using solid movement, head, head movement as well, not standing in front of Jacare. Showed a solid leg kick. He's very physically strong for the division, has a good sprawl, good takedown defense. Good in the clinch as well, very dangerous. He'll land very hard uppercuts and uh, finish you with them. He did that against Yushin Okami. Against Josh Man, he was, <clears throat> he was able to deny takedowns and, um, you know, reverse position, finish with hard ground and pound. He has nasty elbows on the ground. This is an interesting fight because Carlos Jr., uh, if he gets it down at any time, he'll have a chance to finish Tim Bosch because Tim Bosch isn't so great off his back and he can't be submitted. But it'll be hard for Carlos Jr. to get this fight to the ground. You know, Tim is a better striker, has much more KO power. And I think he's a better wrestler as well. And if he can keep it up, even if it gets, even if he's in top position, even if he's on the ground, I think that he'd be able to beat up Antonio from the guard. But mostly, if he can keep it on the feet and execute his game plan, and he is a game planner. He's someone that, you know, against Johnny Hendricks, he was using a ton of movement, front kicks, and uh, when he had the side advantage, he was using hard inside leg kicks, really trying to uh, stick to that game plan of staying long. So I think it's possible that. Carlos Jr. will be able to clinch and take him down, but I'm not sold on Carlos Jr. quite yet. I think he showed some major striking flaws, and I think Tim Bosch is good enough for us to deny Carlos Jr. those entries. I think he's going to be able to land a right hand that Antonio Carlos Jr. doesn't see coming, and I think that he's going to finish him with ground and pound. And uh, I think Tim Bosch is going to keep it going, man. I'm going to go with the old war horse to get it done. Tim Bosch by uh, TKO. And up next, we have another pretty good female fight in... Um, Courtney Casey against Michelle Watterson. And, uh, you know, this is a pretty fun fight. Both these girls are have their backs against the wall. They're coming off losses and kind of want to get back in that title picture. Michelle Watterson, the karate hottie, she's a popular fighter. You know, but I think she's kind of best suited for 105 pounds. And she's fighting a big girl here in Courtney Casey. So this is a tall order. But she comes out with southpaw karate stand. She throws nice side kicks both to the, to the legs and to the body. She can go up to the head with that kick as well. She's very good with her front leg, very dexterous. She's quick with her in-and-out movement, has a good right hand, and uh, always has her uh, right hand up high. She has a nice, you know, teep to the body, and will throw a nice round kick to the body too. Good job of uh, faking and fainting, using false starts to keep her distance, try to hide her attacks. Her legs and uh, kicks are much better than her hands though, and uh, she's much better on the outside than she is in the pocket. And uh, Michelle has a good body lock. She'll go for double underhooks, land the takedown. Very good at taking the back. She lunges in a lot, though, in a lot of her attacks, even when she's going for takedowns and or striking. And they're all in straight lines. So I could see that she could be countered by a good boxer. And uh, she seems to get her, uh, physically bullied in the clinch by her opponents. Like I said, 
she's very small for the division, and they're able to spin her around, land big knees and elbows, and uh, she struggles when you pressure her, smother her kicks, but she has a good head and arm throw, but that's a very dangerous move in MMA, because people can take your back, and especially against a long girl like Courtney Casey, uh, and she actually did take Randy Marcus's back earlier in the fight when she did the head and arm choke, so... Um, you know, that's something that I'm not sure Watterson should do in this fight. But on top, Watterson doesn't go for a lot of ground and pound. But she's good control and she's opportunistic with submissions. And uh, she did not do much at all on top versus Tisha Torres in their most recent fight. She's 2-2 two and two in four UFC fights. And uh, she had a great performance against Paige Van Sant where she showed her dominant grappling advantage. secured a quick submission. But, you know, showed where she was with her... You know, getting outclassed and dominated against Rose Namajunas and kind of dominated and then clinch again. And uh, she was rocked by a head kick and ultimately finished the rear naked choke. She had a solid fight with Torres. She won a round in that fight. She has great heart. She'll never quit, you know. But she does get a bit tired in round three. And I think Courtney Casey's a very underrated fighter. She's big and long, comes out aggressive. She tries to stay long with her punches but come in with long uppercuts, one-two combinations, Good pop in her punches. In her fight with Reina Marcos, like I said, she was able to take the back off the head and arm throw. And eventually she got, uh, she was landing some big hard elbows in that fight. Hard ground and pound. And eventually she was able to win that fight by uh, arm bar. And uh, she likes the left hand uppercut combination. And she has fast hands. She has long punches as well. Those good high kicks. She'll attack with knees uh, to the middle and to the head. She's strong in the clinch. She gets double underhooks and or the plum clutch. She'll land hard knees and elbows. She puts herself in position to be taken down, though, and for people to get on top of her, she kind of almost uh, falls down sometimes. But she's pretty good off her back, has good up kick. She showed that against Jessica Aguilar. And uh, she's always thrown in combination. She attacks hard when she has you against the cage. And uh, unless Casey gets taken down and held out, I can't see her losing this fight. She's better on the feet, stronger in the clinch. She's going to bully Michelle. And uh, Michelle will need this fight on the ground. Uh, if not, Casey will win a decision. And I think Casey's going to be able to bully Michelle, just win pretty easily. And I think it's going to be dominant. I'm going to go with Courtney Casey by decision. And uh, up next, we have Israel Adesanya against Marvin Vittori. And, you know, this is a very interesting, very close fight. You know, I'm going to be very intrigued what the line's going to say for this fight. But um, Israel Adesanya is getting another step up in competition. And his stand-up game is definitely on another level than uh, his MMA opponent. He's a technician. You know, he really likes to snipe with single shots. Great footwork. You know, his head movement's just incredible. Very elite head movement. Very nice, long, straight punches. Against Rob Wilkinson, you could see that once he got in space, he was just able to eat Rob Wilkinson up. He was landing those teep kicks to the body. Very nice jab. Very nice straight right hand. Um, was just throttling him, but you know, he's very calm, composed, never goes crazy, loses his technique, he's always throwing, you know, maybe 80% on his shots, and, or 50% on his shots, and then he'll throw a big shot to the body or something, and just kind of like, wears you down, and uh, you know, he's able to get up, show a decent takedown defense against Rob Wilkinson, especially against the cage, Wilkinson was not able to get him down very much, I think he defended 7 out of 8 takedowns, and uh, on the ones that he was getting, he was standing right back up. And uh, Rob Wilkinson, you could tell by that, was getting extremely tired and worn out. And by round two, Adesanya was able to work his striking from a distance. Was really landing hard body shots. And uh, Wilkinson took him down maybe a couple times. But like I said, he never got any top control. Adesanya was always right back to his feet. So calm in those situations. And I think that he knows that you're going to be gassed and he's going to get up and finish you. I think that... He stays very calm. Most strikers, like Muslim Salikov, he's not as calm or as, you know, just seems like he doesn't transition as well to MMA as Adesanya. And Adesanya is very charismatic, and I'm sure the UFC would love for him to win again, get pushed. But um, Marvin Vittori is a young, improving middleweight. Big and bulky, likes to close the distance to make the fight in close quarters. He has okay striking. He'll attack the lead uppercuts and hook combinations. Has some decent hand speed, but he doesn't throw a ton of kicks, but he will throw a few inside leg kicks, body kicks. Against Akhmedov, he was doing a solid job of countering in the pocket, but he was getting hit with wide hooks in the pocket. Looked uncomfortable striking going backwards, and he has a good step in knee. 
tries to stop you, stop your forward momentum with that knee. And he was able to get a few takedowns against uh, Miranda and uh, off of catching kicks, Vitor Miranda, in one of their fights. So really good at catching kicks, going for the takedowns. But he really isn't someone that will shoot on the open mat. But he definitely will be trying to close the distance, get Israel against the cage, get that body lock, get him to the ground in this fight. And he does have solid grappling skills on top. Good ground and pound. He was able to defend most of Antonio Carlos Jr.'s attempts and land hard elbows when he got on top. Very aggressive. And if he gets on top of Adesanya and gets actual top position, Adesanya could be in trouble. Um, you know, uh, he has some decent transitions off his back as well. He was looking for an arm bar, looking for a triangle. And he looked like he had some confidence with himself off his back. He has a good chin. He had a war in his last fight against... Uh, Amari Akhmedov took a ton of big shots, got his leg beaten up pretty bad as well too, and he doesn't have, uh, you know, the greatest uh, cage control and knees and elbows, and he needs to address his cardio, he gets tired in round two and is very tired come round three, and uh, in his fights he's usually more of a striker in the cage, but has some defensive deficiencies, he keeps his hands low, um, definitely, especially his left hand is very low. He was getting tagged with right hands against Akhmedov. He also likes to lunge in from the outside with shots and kind of jut his chin out there. And uh, he ducks his head as well, making himself susceptible to the uppercut. And in this fight, he'll need to be in Israel's chest all fight. Uh, you know, just not give him any space. Because if they're in space, he's going to get lit up like a Christmas tree. But he seems like a fairly good athlete. But he isn't the fastest guy because he's kind of big and bulky. And uh, really, he needs to work on closing that distance. And he fought in a war, took a lot of big shots just three months ago, so I wonder about his chin. And, uh, you know, I think Vittorio already has cardio issues when he strikes. I think that he's going to get very tired trying to hold down, take down Adesanya. I think he might win the first, first round, maybe the first round and a half. And then when you finally see Adesanya get some space, maybe middle of round two, late round two, I think you're just going to see the advantage and the just panic and tiredness in Vittori. I think that Adesanya is going to start to unload with some big shots, some big combinations, and I think that he's going to finish um, Marvin Vittori in round three by TKO. I'm going to keep say that Adesanya keeps the train rolling, gets another win, and I'm going to go with Israel Adesanya. And uh, up next, we're on to the co-main event here, and it's Carlos Condit against uh, Alex Oliveira. And this is a very interesting fight here because Alex Oliveira, you know, is coming back from a war more recently, and he's taken this fight on short notice. He's coming back four months from that Yancey Medeiros fight, and we all, you know, saw how Yancey Medeiros came back from that fight, losing in the first round. So you have to keep a wary, uh, weary eye on the chin. And uh, we all remember the old Condit, man, the guy that went to war with Robbie Lawler, took out Dan Hardy, Mark Kitman, Thiago Alves, but he might be gone, man. He hasn't won a fight in nearly three years. And, um, his last win was in May 2015 against Thiago Alves. Lost three in a row and just fought three times, you know, in three years. And after a long layoff, came back to fight Neil Magny. And um, that'll be the main fight I'm focusing on. And when I look at his technique, because I just don't want to look that far back. But he was doing a lot of circling and moving backwards, trying to stay long. Throw a lot of front kicks to the body with both legs and was trying to land a straight punch right after the front kick. He looked pretty good at times when he was attacking, moving forward. He'd land an inside kick, uh, and then maybe move inside with the uppercut, try to land a step in the elbow, but he never quite landed the elbow, never quite got his range right. And, uh, you know, if he could, I think that could be a pretty, uh, good, um, offensive move right there with that elbow. He could cut people open with it. But he still had the same problems he's had his whole career. He's getting out grappled, taken down. He consistently loses the underhook battle and the clinch. Let's himself get taken down or gets controlled against the cage. Off his back, he is dangerous, but way too complacent to stay on his back. He goes for leg locks. He went for a lot of them versus Magni, so it seems maybe he was training that while he was gone. He'll attack with arm bars as well. He has some decent entries into his shots. He had some decent entries into his shots with the striking against uh, Magni. You know, he's able to land shots, angle out. He likes to set everything up off of kicks. And if you attack right after his kicks, he seems to struggle to open up or get range. He tried to stand in Kimura against in round three against Magni, but wasn't really close. 
He was throwing an open hand slap with his left hand in that fight. Um, solid attacks when he was able to get Mag- Magni against the fence. You know, he'd start with the body punch he'd, and then try to land some combination punches off of that. But like I said, never really got anything going very good. He had good head movement in that fight. He always comes in great shape, always comes for three rounds. And uh, I think that he's now facing one of the best guys in the clinch in the entire division in a much tougher matchup than Matt Brown, man. And uh, Oliver is so loose and calm in the cage. He has a lot of fun in there. And um, like I said, though, he's coming back four months after that war against Yancey, so we're going to have to see how his chin looks. But he's one of the most dangerous guys in the division, man. Huge power. You saw that when he flatlined Ryan LaFleur with a scary uppercut. And uh, Condit's never been finished with strikes, but he did say he got rocked by a small ground strike versus Maya. He's been in a lot of wars, so he needs to be careful with Cowboy's power early. And uh, Cowboy Oliver is very athletic, fast, and wild on the feet. We use a lot of lateral movement, throw hard inside leg kicks. Luby and punches come in with a flash blitz. He has a nasty teep kick to the body. Extremely powerful uppercut. He killed LaFleur with an uppercut. He's extremely aggressive at times. He was he was extremely aggressive against Yancey Medeiros. You know, blitzed him early, landed very hard straight lefts. Does a good job of getting double underhooks in a clinch, keeping control, landing nasty knees to the body. He gets wrist control, lands hard knees to the body, and he has good elbows on the break. He's very fast in closing that distance, especially with with that straight right hand. He has a really nice standing elbow. When he has you hurt, he goes for the finish, man. He had Yanti and Medeiros so as close to being finished as, you know, someone can be. Can be. Landed a nice double knee to the body against Yancey. And Alex Oliveira's offensive weapons in that fight just looked amazing, you know. His front kick to the body. And uh, I think that he can be one of the best in the division. If he can just hone that aggressiveness, just calm his pace, and uh, just get better at mixing his strike, striking with his clinch game, I think that he's one of the best in the division, man. And he broke his nose in that fight, though, against Yancey Medeiros. And uh, so you have to see if that continues to be an issue as a very bad break. And he wasn't showing Yancey much respect, you know, not caring about defense much. He has a good chin, though, and good cardio. But he did get tired against Yancey. He took a lot of body shots. But that was one of the craziest wars ever. And at this point, I just think Cowboy's a terrible matchup for Condit. He's faster, a better striker, a better grappler. And Condit only has a chance of getting a KO or a submission. And I just think that's a slight chance. And I think that Cowboy's going to be able to finish him in round one by TKO, man. Makes you sad to see. But I'm going to go with um, Alex Cowboy Oliveira by first round finish. And then up next, you have a great fight. You know, Justin Gaethje against Dustin Poirier. And, uh, you know, both these guys most recently have fights against Eddie Alvarez. Dustin Poirier uh, had a fight against Anthony Pettis after that, in which he looked great as well. And, uh... You know, you know what you're going to get out of these guys. You're going to get the battle, of war of attrition. And basically, Justin Gaethje comes in, uh, doesn't really care about defense. He shells up a lot, just walks forward, lets you punch him, lets you hit him. Uh, gives you a lot of body shots. I think Eddie Alvarez kind of set the blueprint to beat Justin Gaethje. Land a lot of body shots, hurt him to the body, go upstairs, and, uh, you know, land that kill shot. But it's kind of a war of attrition with Justin Gaethje, man, because of the leg kicks. Lands so many hard leg kicks, stays in your face, really likes to be in that pocket, will exchange in the pocket with hooks. But really, it's just the leg kicks, man. The leg kicks take you out. And, um, you know, it's really the battle of can you finish Justin Gaethje before he takes you out with the leg kicks. And uh, Poirier has shown susceptibility and, you know, really been hurt by leg kicks. You saw that against Jim Miller when he was kind of falling down from the leg kick and uh, seemed to have major trouble. But he was able to get him down with takedowns in that fight. Showed he fought through a lot of adversity. And uh, the people that think that Dustin Poirier is a quitter, he likes to quit in fights, I just don't see that at all. I think Poirier is a beast, man. He has big power, especially at 155. He's shown his power to be huge. Great stance switching now. He goes, throws, really likes to throw that southpaw left hand, then go to the orthodox jab so he can stay in front of you. Uh, his left straight still has money shot. Big power on that, man. He could knock a lot of people out. I think he really does have some of the biggest power in the 155-pound division. Really nice left left kick. Really nice fancy and fakes. And I think that'll be a big thing in this fight because you saw against Michael Johnson and against Eddie Alvarez, um, Gaethje really bites on fence a lot. 
And, uh, you know, Poirier will actually go for the outside low kick himself. But he is hittable as well. You know, he really likes to brawl, likes to get in that pocket. And uh, But he did show against Eddie Alvarez. He was being much more technical, using a lot more of his skills, going in and out, a lot more speed. And just looking like that was one of his best performances in his octagon career. But uh, obviously the unfortunate finish in that fight. But Poirier showed against Anthony Pettis his clinch wrestling, his body lock, his double legs, his good BJJ defense, good takedown defense. And he was just dominating Anthony Pettis, you know. Broke him in that fight, took him down, eventually beat him. And, um, you know, Justin Gaethje's coming back just four months after that war with uh, Eddie Alvarez where he was absolutely you know, dusted, man, and that's just not very long, and all these guys, a lot of these guys are coming back from quick, quick, uh, things, and, you know, one of them, it's def, you know, you know one of these guys for sure, one of these guys that we see that are four months, three months coming back after a KO, one of them is going to get knocked out again, you know it, you know one of these guys, because I named about four or five of these guys doing that, and I just think Justin Gaethje, I think that, like I said, it's going to be a war of attrition, and Justin Gaethje's got his career, you know, gotten by a lot in his career on pure toughness, pure tenacity. And I think Poirier is going to be too good for him, man. I think he's going to be too clean going to the body, going to the head. And I think he will get his leg beat up. Make no mistake about it. It's going to be a dog fight. Every fight against Justin Gaethje is. But I think Poirier is going to be able to knock him out, man, in round two. And um, I think that Justin Gaethje takes entirely too much punishment. And uh, coming back four months after getting knocked out like that against Eddie Alvarez, after taking all of that punishment, I just don't think that's the greatest idea, you know, in the world. And that's why I'm going to go with Dustin Poirier in this fight. And I'm going to say that he wins by TKO in round two. And um, for my most confident pick of the night, guys, I'm going to say it's going to be um, Arjun Buller to defeat Adam Weiserich. And uh, for the parlay of the week, I'm going to say let's do... Adam or Arjun Bular and um, John Moraga, that could be a good parlay, or Arjun Bular and Alex Cowboy Oliveira. And for an underdog parlay, the, the lines haven't come out yet, but I'm just going to make an assumption on this that they could potentially be underdogs. And um, I'm going to say that the underdog parlay that you could do could potentially be um, Ricky Rainey. And Tim Bosch, that might be a good play that you could pick. Or maybe you could do um, Yushin Okami and Tim Bosch. But getting in that Yushin Okami business right now, I just don't really think is a good idea. I think um, Matthew Lopez is a pretty uh, good bet. Like I said, I think Luke Saunders also could definitely be in my most confident pick. Now I'm thinking about it, um, I'm still going to stick with Bula I being my most confident pick, but I'm very confident in Luke Saunders as well. I'm fairly confident in Courtney Casey. So those are quite a few reasons I'm giving you. And um hope you guys like the show. Subscribe for more. And um we'll be back next week for another great week of fights.